Thanks so much for having me back. I'm actually, uh, this is my opening slide from All Things Open, which if you didn't know, they have their call for speakers currently open. Uh, so go get that in and go speak there later this year. Um, but I'm actually gonna kinda do a little pivot on you. We're actually gonna switch and narrow it down slightly from just modern web applications, that large idea, to a specific idea, uh, which I'm calling data structures all the way up. Which if you didn't know, naming uh, talks is about as difficult as naming a variable. Um, one of the difficult problems in computer science, public speaking, life. Uh, but what I hope to accomplish today um, is really to change how you think about UI development. So I'm gonna show three or four demos of uh, specific implementations, but don't focus too much on the implementation details. Uh, I hope you take the ideas with you into whatever environment you work in, whatever technology you use, uh, whatever your tool chain looks like. Um, I think it's more broadly accessible like that. Uh, so I'm gonna define UI development, at least for the purposes of the next 45 minutes, as a transformation of domain data and interface data. Uh, our typical workflow as front-end developers um, basically goes, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that the backend cares about and knows about, and here's a design from your designer. Uh, it might be a static mock, it might be an interactive prototype, um, but either way, it's your job to take and merge those things into a living, breathing thing uh, that, at least in this room, is typically HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, though this probably would equally apply to native iOS, Android, Windows, web forms, components. Um, so to define interface data, uh, it's structures that you can transform and ma manipulate, just like any other layer. Um, have you ever considered being able to actually take your HTML, CSS, JavaScript and program on those like inputs themselves, take those as inputs and actually have them come out as outputs on the other side? Um, so not just thinking of like active record models as your data, but the interface itself. Um, and just so you know, to try to like make this weird concept, a little bit more concrete, we're gonna start with a little demo of what happens when you actually do this. Uh, so this is a personas tool that uh, we're working on internally at Skookum. Um, it's pretty small, lightweight, which is great for uh, trying to show you in three minutes. Um, but it's basically just personas that have a list view and detail view. Uh, no big deal, since it's a demo, I don't actually get all my markdown. I'll call myself out on things. Um, so this is cool, not really anything interesting to it. But what if I could actually look at the source code that creates this and then automatically create style guides from that? So now we're working on style guides. As we can, we're not just like actually building a style guide with the designer's tool chain in isolation. It's actually, through the framework we're using, guaranteed to be the exact same code base that we use in production. And we can automatically pull out stuff like this documentation uh, from the source file, like from the source code, we can actually see that paper takes a depth, rounded circle uh, of these types. In other words, data, or that a persona list item actually takes a complex property, which is a persona that takes, uh, has six properties on it. So let's start, is that totally me? Hopefully that's not so scratchy. Um, let's start breaking those down piece by piece. Let's start at the CSS layer, because CSS as a data structure is actually probably the most simple of all of them that we'll deal with. Um, who has uh, ever used underscore or lodash? Or any JavaScript framework? I can't see if you're raising your hand or not, so I'm just pretending you're all raising your hand. <laughs> so if you've done so, you actually know everything you need to actually start uh, hacking on these things as data structures. Uh, all they are is objects and arrays of objects. Uh, and if you can loop over them and look at them and manipulate them, uh, you can transform them and change them. Uh, but first I wanna talk about CSS a little more broadly, and I'm actually gonna steal this straight from uh, Vue, Christopher Chideau, he's an engineer at uh, Facebook, on problems of CSS to scale. And scale defines both number of developers on a project. Uh, in my opinion, as soon as you put more than one developer on CSS, you're operating at scale. Um, and then also as like the, no, the complexity of your code base. So CSS as a language only has a, a global namespace, which we learned many, 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 many years ago in computer science that uh, 
languages with only a global namespace is a really bad idea. It makes it very hard to write predictable programs, safe programs, to avoid bashing somebody else's arbitrarily named variable. Um, yet CSS, the thing that we all spend so much time in, uh, only has global namespaces. Uh, resolving dependencies is really tricky. It's impossible to do dead code elimination because as soon as CSS is on there and you have more than one HTML page in your website, um, it's very tricky and difficult to know, is this selector still used anywhere? Can I remove it safely? If I do, what am I gonna break? Um, so it's the confidence level of removing code is extremely low. Uh, you can't really minify anything outside of removing uh, white space because you can't rename your selector um, with any confidence that it's gonna get renamed in HTML. Of course, you have a framework that marries those two things together. Sharing content since uh, in isolation are two more problems. Then non-deterministic resolution. If you load a CSS file and then load another one, everything's great. But then if somehow you load it in a reverse order, uh, the styles will actually resolve differently based on specificity and the cascade. Um, and being able to reason about that is extremely uh, difficult. So let's explore what a CSS abstract syntax tree is. That's really just a fancy way to say lists of objects that may or may not have lists of objects in them. So here's a very, very simple one. Oh, quick background on ASCs as a whole. Uh, most of the time there's not a specific standard or specification for what a uh, AST for a given language will look like. It's kind of up to the parser itself. Um, JavaScript, which we'll talk about in a little bit, sort of has a de facto standard, uh, but CSS, we're just gonna use a, uh, a project called Reworks uh, Parser. Um, I'm gonna walk over here. So you have a basic CSS selector um, that bleeds off into the white, has a couple selectors and a bunch of value property pairs. So what this looks like once it comes through a parser is it's an object with a rules key that has an array of things. That could be selectors, it could be media query blocks, uh, or other valid CSS constructs. Uh, for selectors, every single one, whether it's one or many, you get an array of what they are and then an array of declarations where they're all look just like this. Uh, extremely small, extremely simple. There's maybe five or six no types total. Next demo. So I built this little tool. Actually, I forked this one that you probably can't read, uh, which we'll see in a minute, and just added support for CSS. This is a way to actually interactively add CSS and view that data structure. Uh, if you do want to manipulate it in any way, it's very useful to be able to actually visualize it. So this style sheet happens to have a bunch of rules. Uh, you can see that as I have over one area, I can actually see what's highlighted on the other side, um, so on and so forth. And the most complex it's gonna get is when you have a media query block and you have rules inside of one of the top level nodes. Um, but you're not gonna recurse really any deeper than that. See, very simple, very predictable. Uh, trying to extend this is now fairly trivial. Um, which I think we might as well go ahead and try to do now. So the thing you could do with this is actually prevent all developers from using important. The cascade is already difficult enough, so let's support, or let's prevent people from using the golden hammer on our application. Is that visible at all? Should I make it larger? Is anybody out there? Yes. Um, <laughs> all right, so how does that work? I added these nice annotations to my code to tell you where to look. Um, rework takes a string of CSS, it parses it, and then every function that goes to the use block uh, receives that AST and can do whatever it wants to it as long as it returns an AST at the end. And then again, we want to return it to a string. If anything inside that throws an error, uh, return that error message, otherwise just log the result. So let me fix this real quick. This is the site it should be. Apologize that I half wrote my demo before I came up here. So the source file you can see coming out on the right side of the screen uh, is just body, h2, media screen. What we want to be able to do is prevent this from ever making it through our continuous integration platform. Uh, if anybody ever puts important in there, like we should have a git pre-commit hook or other tooling that says, hey, don't do that. This is why you shouldn't do that. So it's both a tool to protect the code base and educate our developers on common practices. So everything below this line 
is just a bunch of random stuff to generate those logs. What we really care about is inside of here, um, want to take, I wish I could reach that high. Should I start jumping? Uh, for our AST, uh, we want to go through every single rule, um, parse through all the dec declarations, and then if it's important, we want to throw an error, and if it's not, we can continue on. So if declaration, ooh. If somebody used important in our declaration uh, value, which we can see from coming back here, declaration value, we want to make sure that nobody's doing this, no importance allowed. Um, if it is, add it to our results list, and then down below we'll say, hey, if there's anything in the results list, throw an error. You know, see, I actually never got my HTML back. I got these annoying messages saying, please don't be so self-important. And it also tells me the location in the source code to look for. So that's pretty straightforward. I can now go and actually just remove those. But in any arbitrary CSS code base, there's probably valid use cases for why you want to use important. So we want to prevent the common use case, but provide an escape hatch. So let's add this yellow hash bang that says, you only live once. Might as well actually make this one really important. So let's create another CSS extension to the language that actually says anything that's YOLO is really important in our output. So there's two things we need to do at this point. We need to come and add YOLO to our use statement. Then we need to modify YOLO. So the declaration value, whenever something is YOLO'd, uh, becomes important. So what do we want to do? Uh, let's replace all All right, so now in the previous five minutes, we both added our own custom linters to the CSS language and extended the language for our current needs. So that's the kind of things you can do when you actually start treating your code as data structures you can operate on. Um, looking for other ideas, uh, Etsy wrote a blog post uh, a few months ago on how they transition from CSS to SCSS at scale. For them, scale means not just the number of developers, but like 1.2 million lines of CSS. Um, they did this by both using the rework ASC processor and another one for SCSS to validate that all the code that went in one input came out the exact same on the other side. Because um, of course, when you have 1.2 million lines of CSS in a language that, like if you throw an error in there, the browser's never gonna notice or care or tell you about it. So they would have things like seven digit hex values in their CSS, which would totally just make it through, but in SCSS that would blow up. So they'd be able to automate their actual cleansing of their CSS at that level, while also maintaining uh, intentional CSS hacks like the star selector for old IE. Uh, Facebook's view, his talk CSS and JS, uh, and Harry, I'm not sure his last name, I wrote a blog post on the CSS specificity graph, uh, which is the concept that CSS specificity should be trending upwards if you graphed out it throughout your code base. In most code bases, it's probably like arbitrary spikes. Um, and so you could trivially, in this, uh, using rework or any CSS ASD processor, uh, add to your build step something that actually looks through all the code base and graphs it and just make sure that every commit doesn't make it worse within some threshold. Uh, so that way, uh, it's probably not very feasible to go and just rewrite all your CSS to be a perfect graph on, like, in one day, but you could set up tooling and safeguards to start evolving your code in that way. Also, all these slides will be available online, so don't worry about writing these down or memorizing them. Uh, them afterwards. So, also, if you have any questions, I can't see you, but feel free to just, like, yell out and interrupt me in the middle. Um, JavaScript. We're not going to go too deep on the ASC side. I'm just going to show you what's possible. Because JavaScript is a much more complex language than CSS. Uh, it has approximately 84 nodes in the SpiderMonkey implementation. 
Um, but why the heck would you go down this rabbit hole of programming your JavaScript in JavaScript and actually transforming it? Uh, well, you can do a lot of really cool things. Uh, you can automate a lot of common practices. You can automatically generate optimizations. You can create your own custom linting rules. ESLint is actually sensible because it uh, surfaces its internal representation. You can uh, enforce specific code style, uh, extend the language. Basically, anything a superhero could do, you could do. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the job AST isn't really standardized, but this one in particular has kind of a community standard. Uh, that's because many years ago, a Mozilla engineer by the name of uh, David Herman just happened to document what the internal spider monkey representation was. Um, and since it was documented online, people started implementing it according to that interface. So tools like Esprima, Rework, Acorn, uh, Babel.js all implement this. Um, Dave Herman, the author of Babel and a few others have actually started working on officially on a specification for it rather than just an arbitrary MDN page. Um, but nonetheless, the important thing is that this is actually more or less standardized the community, which means there's a lot of tools that interop interoperate. I do really neat things. So just to show you a very small example of what a JavaScript AST looks like, uh, we have this very simple program. It just says console log, hello, Poscon, um, which ends up being an expression statement. And expression statements have expressions and arguments, uh, which could be an array of anything in arguments. And the expression could be a call expression, a member expression. Uh, actually, I think there's one or two other expression types. Not 100% certain off the top of my head. This is why I use tools to figure out what I'm talking about. Well, let's start looking into that. So the outside, the console.log is what's known as a member expression in the JavaScript AST. It can be computed or not, um, and then the object and the property. Uh, and the property, once again, I'm fairly certain it could be a member expression itself, so it could be like window.console.log, um, and nest these infinitely deeply. It has to be representable somehow. This happens to be how console.log is represented. And then the arguments. is very conveniently two literals, uh, which just have a value. Could be a string, could be a number, boolean, uh, whatever is known as like a primitive type in JavaScript could be a literal. So there's two pseudo demos I want to show you right now. One is uh, what I did at Skookum a few months ago. We had uh, five client projects using AMD. Who's familiar with AMD, the asynchronous module definition? Um, it's pretty popular. Uh, module system for JavaScript. Uh, but we happen to be using some tools that actually preferred and worked much better in the common JS world. So I could either go through these five projects manually uh, and figure out how to like, uh, or just manually go transform every single AMD call site to a common JS call site. Or I could learn about ASTs and write a program in half a day that would do all of it for me and equip me to do this kind of thing in the future. So this is where this tool in particular came in to be very useful. Because this is what a uh, AMD definition looks like. There's a few other syntactic options for writing valid AMD calls, but uh, see, like when you look at this, you can probably see like this is how I need to match things to transform it to common JS. Like what that should look like in a common JS world would be var what's on the inside of your function call. Uh, so function react function app should be our locally bound variables, um, and then just match it with the index in the earlier array. Copy paste, like professionals. So what we want to do is, at scale across hundreds of files um, and five different Git repos, let's transform the first one to the second one. If you understand how to traverse an AST and manipulate it, um, you can automate this entire process. Uh, the reason for the anonymous block is because I didn't want every single code, line of code in the entire project to look like I wrote it. Um, 
So that way I wanted the get disk to be like the bare minimum needed to make these valid JavaScript programs. Because uh, although that is ugly, it is valid. Uh, one other thing you can do with JavaScript ASTs is automatically de generate that documentation I showed you earlier. Um, so here's another quick example. Uh, I literally wrote this entire thing from the beginning or ground up in 30 minutes. That's why it's so creative that it has my face and really ugly. Um, I'm going to show you the code. What does it take to actually do this? So I have a user can actually view in the browser alongside of it. And then on any project, any page was just like a few lines of code, I can tie this together. So I just press the question mark. That's what I did to switch the view. I'm actually on the same exact URL, same page, same code running everything, just press question mark. Um, or if you want to actually make it rich and in line, I can just add mouse over uh, functions to everything. So when I mouse over a specific component, um, I can see that documentation live right on the screen. So think, like for someone coming into the system for the first time, uh, like you hire someone new or someone just transferred to your team and they need to get familiar with the landscape, uh, think of how much quicker they'd be able to get up to speed uh, and be able to make confident contributions to your code when they can actually see this right in line. So uh, you can do pretty much anything. Um, I highly recommend unlock the structure of your React apps uh, with the JST or AST. Um, I cannot say the name of the person who did that, uh, but it's amazing. Like he took, like I just showed you some documentation. You guys can actually see like on the sidebar the entire app state, what properties are going where, what the state of the application is, uh, both the UI layer and the underlying data powering that. And then Aria Hadayat, uh, is the author of Esprima, and there's a ton of great resources and ideas on his blog of how you can actually instrument uh, your code to get uh, better metrics, figure out where the hotspots are, like figure out what you should work on, what's uh, either scary and not maintainable and needs uh, some fixing, or what like, might just be slow and you could optimize. So we're kind of cheating with React. Uh, if you don't know, React is a JavaScript library that marries the behavior of your application to the view. Uh, and we also looked at the CSS. So at this point, we've actually more or less automated or like been able to program against our entire view, like our entire browser view. So the last step is like, how do we actually take all this stuff and get it into the browser? Do you have any tools like that you're currently using that actually give you access to that data structure um, of the entire dependency tree of every single URL on your application? But once you do, like, it really changes the way you think about writing your programs. Uh, you no longer, it actually reduces a ton of stuff you need to think about. You no longer have to care about how is this CSS gonna get on that page, or how do I guarantee that uh, the right JavaScript files are in place, or how do I know like, what JavaScript files should I pull out into a common uh, vendor file that is like, viewed on every single URL and then have URL specific ones. Because um, when you have a dependency tree, uh, it's Somebody else can do the computer science and algorithms, but it's known structures and problem spaces to actually go around and automate this. So let's go back to the kind of first example where I'm a developer and someone gives me this. This may or may not be the next Qcom website. Um, so this is actually kind of a real scenario. I'm given this and I have to figure out how to actually recreate this in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Which at one page is pretty straightforward but eventually it'll be two. Um, either way, I can write this in whatever I want, I can use whatever tools I want, as long as at the end of the day, I give the browser those three technologies. So let's look at that simple dependency tree, when we only have one HTML page. Uh, the HTML page is more or less your main, the browser says, get this, and then it starts looking through all the dependencies and loading them and parsing them as needed. Uh, with HTML page, it's a JavaScript file, JPEG, CSS, which may or may not request some more dependencies. Um, but really, that's already probably too simplistic. Because your JavaScript file probably has a few other dependencies, uh, third-party libraries that may or may not require other dependencies, which may or may not be written in JavaScript. Um, and there's systems in place already today that actually can understand the structure, can handle 
JavaScript files, requiring copy files, script files, requiring closure script files, what have you. But then we add a second HTML page. And all of a sudden we have certain shared dependencies uh, and then other individual unique ones to that URL. Wouldn't it be great if already at this point I had some way to just say, hey, take all this stuff that's common, throw it into a common JS file, I'll put that on every single page, and then I'll have my system that understands this tree be responsible for saying like, hey, here's some extra JavaScript for this page. Uh, this is actually further, made further complex in the new HTTP2 world. Uh, if you're not familiar, HTTP1 uh, is where we've been living for the past 20 plus years. Uh, our best practices of concatenating all of our images together, uh, spriting images, minifying JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, um, is actually anti-patterns in HTTP2. It'll actually slow down the initial page render and performance of your applications. In HTTP2, the server can just say like, hey, here's a bunch of stuff and like interleave those dependencies. So trying to think of like how to support that in most any system today uh, kind of boggles my mind. But as soon as I have this structure, I can now automate the entire process of saying, hey, if it's HTML1, go down this path. If it's HTML2, go down this path. Um, and no app code has to change. While as the author of any component inside that application, you don't have to care about any of this information. So taking those c concerns and truly separating them into the places where they're cared about. Uh, so here's two pseudo demos. Um, the first is the uh, the first experiment we talked about. This style or not style guide. The personas tool that also includes the style guide. Um, I'm using a tool called Webpack. There's other ones on the market that are fully uh, capable of doing the same kind of thing. But Webpack includes an analyzer, so I can just say like, hey, here's my main or my multiple entry points into the app. Um, whatever you do, whatever they require, go figure it out, and then I'll put all that into a stats.json file, which they also happen to have an analyzer, so I can just upload that, excuse me, and actually visualize what happened. So I can see like, oh, it took almost half a second to actually generate this build. Even though it's really only one page, I already have 343 modules. Um, at the end of the day, I generated two chunks with five assets. And now my browser will come to a crawl as I open up this actual graph. And you can see like there's actually a living, breathing system powering these things. Um, but you've never probably surfaced this and actually looked like below or at this level where this is not like a data structure. This is S3 or D3 displaying some stuff, which means you can actually like loop over that, iterate on it, uh, extend it. You can do certain things in development versus production. Um, and it's all a, an understandable, controllable level. Uh, and I believe in this, I don't want to crash my browser, but you can actually tap in and look like at deeper dependencies. You can say like, oh, out of all these dependencies, what does this one over here require? And then lastly, Webpack. I'm a big fan because this is, this is actually my slides from All Things Open. Uh, I had to actually not use Webpack at this time. And a fellow named Dan Dean tweeted that the complexity of creating multiple bundles with shared resources via Browserify is making me look into Webpack. So even though I had never done this, I sent him this link because I knew it existed in Webpack to optimize common code in one line. Uh, and if you look at the timestamps, I sent him that at 1.40. Less than an hour later, he had switched from Browserify to Webpack and had the, exactly what he wanted. And that one line looks like this. New Webpack optimized Commons Chunk plugin. Thank you for doing all the work for me. Um, which leads to the final demo, which is actually our first demo, once again. So we're going to look at the style guide. So I already showed that if we can actually operate on our data structure or on our interfaces as data structures, we can generate things like automatic uh, style guides that include both documentation and what that visual is. Um, let me come back here. So this George Lucas creator of Star Wars component is this exact same component. And using Webpack and a module system, 
it's guaranteed that the same code powering here is the exact same code in production. Now we have a safe environment uh, where a designer can go, operate on this stuff independently, um, with confidence that it's gonna look the same in production. We also now have an isolated scenario automatically that we can create uh, diffs, visual diffs, to see if we have regressions accidentally. Um, it's gonna be much more scalable to do it in isolation compared to in production where you're gonna get a lot of false positives from uh, arbitrary data changing. Because here I can just manually say like, hey, this is my data block. Just use this, don't worry about going into the database uh, where the data may or may not change. Um, this is gonna be tricky to show because the screen is so small. But now that we have a system that understands everything and totally collapses in on itself, uh, you've probably used a CSS live reloader. CSS is a pretty easy live reload. You just remove the old one from the link and stick a new one in there. CSS can reload uh, on the fly without impacting page state at all. What if you could actually do that with JavaScript? What if you could take your build tool, take your JavaScript source files, and it could live inject that changed JavaScript into the page? and not change the state of the application, but just update the UI. So this is gonna be a really poor example since there's not really dynamic state, but I can reorganize things. And if I have it running, I was very subtle, I'll do it one more time, but if you see male, 70 years old, Caucasian, um, that stuff's gonna live reload, change the sort order, re-render with the same state, same data. The page wasn't refreshed, the state of the application didn't change, it just sucked some JavaScript in there, re it in place of its old one, and re-rendered. Uh, there's another demo where a guy wrote Flappy Bird in script live, like never had to go to the browser, hit refresh, the bird kept flapping as he changed state. He could change it so like, hey, change the, d the vo velocity of your jump. And it would just like, bloom, bloom, uh, without him ever having to go there or refresh the app state, refresh at all. Um, it really changes how you program when you can actually see that live feedback loop immediately. So with that, I hope that you do change how you think about UI development. Uh, Feel free to reach out to me and talk to me. Uh, if you want any help, like how you could apply these ideas where you are. Um, but I hope you just take it and run with it and build awesome things of the future. Thanks so much.